Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Subhutai Ahmed. I'm a researcher at Numenta, which is a small research lab located in Redwood City in the San Francisco Bay Area in, in uh, California. So first, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, of this workshop for inviting me to speak. I wish we could be there in person and meet, uh, but unfortunately not. Um, my talk today is going to be somewhat unusual in that I'm going to discuss how neuroscience can help us design better continuous learning systems. In particular, I'm going to focus on sparsity and sparsity in the neocortex and its implications for continuous learning. But first, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Numenta. So we're a small research lab uh, at the intersection of neuroscience and computer science. We were founded in 2005 by Jeff Hawkins and Donna Dubinsky, and we really have a two-part mission in the company. Uh, the first uh, part is to try to attempt to reverse engineer the neocortex. That is, we want to create biologically accurate theories, and everything we do is published in open access uh, neuroscience journals and, and proceedings. Uh, the second part of our mission uh, is to apply some of these principles and you know, that we've learned from biology to AI and try to improve uh, current techniques and current machine learning systems. So today, uh, my talk is going to focus on sparsity, and it's going to cover three basic areas. I'm going to first review what is known about sparsity in the neocortex. So I'm going to talk about what we know about sparse activations and connectivity. Um, I'm going to discuss a little bit how we think about the neuron and, and the neuron model. And I'm going to talk about the learning roles that we know about and how they relate to sparsity. In the second part of the talk, um, I'm going to focus on representations. We know in continuous learning that the catastrophic forgetting problem and the stability plasticity dilemma is a key issue that's preventing forward progress in this field. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how sparse representations can relate to these problems of stability and, and plasticity. In the third part of the talk, I'm going to discuss how we can take all of these things that we've learned about sparsity and put it together into a network model uh, towards building an unsupervised continuously learning system. Okay. Okay, so here's a, a video of some experimental recordings. Uh, so this video shows recordings from a section of the mouse cortex. Uh, this is taken while the animal is awake and performing tasks. The square white area actually contains hundreds of neurons packed in there, and the bright lights that are flashing, sh each one shows an individual neuron that's firing. So as you can see, the activity is really sparse. Um, only a small percentage of the cells are actually firing at any point in time. So this phenomenon uh, of very sparse activations is ubiquitous throughout the neocortex. In fact, your brain is behaving exactly like this right now as you listen to me talk. So this is a pretty uh, standard property of uh, cortical uh, representations. So let's get, uh, let's define this a little bit better. What exactly do we mean by sparsity? So sparsity is pretty much when something is mostly missing. So a sparse vector or a sparse matrix is a vector where most of the elements are, are zero. And in neuroscience papers, uh, most papers describe three different types of sparsity. So the first one is uh, population sparsity. That's where you can look at a population of neurons and say, okay, at any point in time, how many neurons are active right now? So the best estimates are that roughly 0.5% to 2% of cells are active at any point in time. Uh, the second measure is something we call lifetime sparsity. That is, if you look at a single neuron instead of a population, just look at a single neuron and look at its activity over its lifetime. Uh, what percentage of the time is the neuron actually firing? So this is a little bit harder to measure experimentally, but you can imagine that if all things being equal, um, then the lifetime sparsity will roughly equal the population sparsity. Uh, the third type of sparsity is actually connection sparsity. And this asks the question, when you have a layer of cells projecting to another layer of cells, what percentage are actually physically connected? And it turns out that this is also extremely sparse. So the best estimates are that somewhere around 1% to 5% of possible neuron-to-neuron -neuron connections actually exist. Now, if you look at all of these properties, uh, the situation looks quite different from typical deep learning systems. The activation vectors in deep learning and the weight matrices are nowhere near as far as, as what we see in the brain. Okay. So this is quite different from uh, you know, today's machine learning systems. So now let's uh, turn our attention to the neuron and how we can think about the neuron model itself. Um, so here's a, 
uh, characterization of what's called the point neuron model. Uh, it's a typical neural model that's used in artificial neural networks. So it takes uh, some scalar inputs, it has scalar weights, and computes a linear weighted sum of its inputs followed by some sort of a differentiable transfer function. So this, these point neuron models, as they're known, were first proposed way back in 1907, and they still represent the core of deep learning models uh, today. However, uh, this is not a neuron. And real neurons are nothing like this. Here's a really beautiful uh, 3D characterization of, uh, of a, what's called a pyramidal neuron, one of a typical neuron that's in, in the, the cortex. As you can see, it looks nothing uh, like a point neuron. It has a very complex uh, arborization and structure. So all of those kind of long wiggly things are, those are called dendrites. And that's where the inputs come into this neuron from other neurons. And as you can see, it's got a really interesting 3D structure. And you can imagine that the computation performed by uh, such a cell is actually quite complex. So the thing I want to focus on are uh, these dendrites. And in particular, um, it, it turns out that dendrites actually detect sparse patterns. So on the left, what I'm showing here is a, again, a typical pyramidal neuron. Uh, these neurons get about 3,000 to 10,000 inputs converging onto them into these connections called synapses. And the inset shows one little segment of the dendrite where the neurons connect into. And it turns out, if you look at the full tree of dendrites, uh, they're actually split into dozens and dozens of independent computational segments. And each of these little segments become activated or they initiate what's called a dendritic spikes and become active if there's a cluster of just 10 to 20 active synapses that are physically co-located on that dendritic segment. So just 10 to 20 out of the thousands of synapses are enough to initiate this little dendritic spike. And it turns out that all of these uh, segments are basically operating in parallel. And so neurons are detecting dozens of highly sparse patterns in parallel. Here's a typical uh, experimental result that characterizes this. Um, and here they're activating you know, some small number of synapses that are within about 130 microns, uh, very close to one another. And you can see that if they activate seven synapses or spines versus eight of them, uh, you get a nonlinear uh, increase in the, in the activations. So neurons are highly, uh, you know, each neuron detects dozens of these highly sparse patterns in parallel. Now, it turns out that the learning in these neurons is also highly sparse. And what do we mean by that? So if you look at uh, these dendritic segments, uh, you know, different parts of the neurons are getting either feed forward uh, inputs or recurrent local inputs or top down inputs. Um, and all of these uh, parts of the dendrite undergo uh, you know, a particular set of uh, learning rules or plasticity rules. And the learning is also localized to these dendritic segments that I mentioned earlier. This is something we call branch-specific plasticity. And the, there are sort of three basic rules. Uh, uh, you know, learning in general is a complex topic, but I'm going to focus on these three rules that uh, have been experimentally discovered. Um, so if a cell ever becomes active or it fires due to some input, uh, if there was a dendritic spike, meaning if there was some independent dendritic segment that had become active, um, the learning rules basically reinforce that segment. However, if there were no dendritic spikes, so no pattern had been detected, uh, then the cell actively grows connections onto some new local area uh, by subsampling cells that have been active in the past. And if the cell was not active at all, but there was a dendritic spike, then it weakens the segments. Okay, so three very simple rules uh, that have been discovered. Now, that's not all. It turns out not only uh, are these, uh, you know, not only does the neuron undergo sparse learning, the learning is actually extremely dynamic, and the connectivity itself is changing. So learning in neurons actually involves growing and dropping synapses. This is something that's called structural plasticity. So the network structure itself is dynamically altered as a function of learning. Okay. So here's an example uh, experimental result. If you uh, look at panel A. Uh, there are, this, uh, this shows the same dendritic segment or segment of the dendrite at two different points in time. The blue arrow shows all the synapses that remained consistent from one point in time to the next. So I think the top segment uh, is taken at uh, time zero and the bottom segment was about four days later. And the red triangles show all of the synapses that were either added or dropped during those four days. 
So if you look at the panel on the right, uh, this shows kind of uh, quantitatively what's happening across a number of different animals and across 20 different days. So on the first day uh, in this particular paper, they counted you know, 400, 1,421 uh, connections or synapses. Uh, four days later, some of those initial connections were gone, but a new set of connections have come up, um, uh, donated, uh, denoted as kind of the second uh, horizontal uh, pattern there. Um, now, and eight days later, eight days from the start, some of the original set of synapses have dropped. Some of the second set of synapses have also dropped, but then there's now a third group of synapses that have come on and so on. And when they quantified this, uh, the authors noticed that something like 31% of the synapses between imaging sessions were turned over. That is, there were at least uh, somewhere around 31% of the synapses were either new or 31% uh, or had, had dropped. So this is a tremendous amount of plasticity and change to the actual network structure that's undergoing as a function of learning. So if you think about all this, um, you know, this is again, quite different from uh, deep learning systems today. So here's a summary of my quick review of uh, sparsity in the neocortex. So I, I mentioned that neural activations and connectivity are, are highly sparse. Um, I talked about the neuron model and how neurons actually detect dozens of independent sparse patterns. And I uh, mentioned that learning itself is sparse. It's localized to these dendritic segments and incredibly dynamic where the structure of the system is, uh, uh, is changing uh, constantly. So in the second part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about the representation and how we can think about stability and plasticity. So the basic message I'm gonna get across is that sparse representations are actually highly stable. And we can think about it and characterize it mathematically as follows. So here's our pyramidal neuron again with thousands of inputs coming into it. Um, so thousands of neurons are sending input into the single uh, neuron. On each of these neurons, we know that a small number of synapses on tiny segments of dendrites recognize uh, these sparse patterns and that the connections themselves are learned. So how can we kind of formalize this? So um, you can think of each dendritic segment as representing a vector uh, shown here as Xi. So the vector uh, might have uh, you know, thousands of elements representing uh, you know, every possible neuron that's connecting into this neuron. And there would be a non-zero element wherever there's an actual connection to one of these uh, neurons that are sending input into, into our, our neuron here. Okay? So a very small percentage of this vector will actually be non-zero representing the eight or 20 synapses. And you can think of the input activity coming in as this another vector xj also with n elements, uh, thousands of elements. And since activity is sparse at any point in time, this vector also will have a very small number of uh, non-zeros. And we can now ask, what is the chance that this dendritic segment is actually gonna recognize this pattern? So we can look at the probability that xi dot xj is gonna be greater than some threshold. So you know, we wanna look at how, what's the chance that the overlap between these two vectors is greater than some. Uh, some threshold. Um, so um, what I'm showing here is um, in the gray circle is the universe of all possible patterns. So uh, this is you know n choose k, whereas k is the sparsity of the of the pattern. Uh, and here I'm showing m different possible uh, patterns. And depending on the th threshold theta, each dendritic segment uh, can recognize some noisy version of the pattern that it's it's recognizing. Okay, so I'm denoting this as the white circle there, um, and as you, and as we uh, decrease theta, um, these white circles will expand. That is, um, the dendritic segment is going to be able to recognize noisier and noisier versions of these patterns because we kind of lowered our our tolerance. So we can get excellent noise robustness by reducing theta, but as you can see, the cost the cost is the chance of increased false positives um, because uh, the other patterns that are you know recognized on other dendrites on other neurons um, those white circles have also increased and there's going to be overlap between them now it turns out you can kind of calculate these probabilities mathematically um, which we've done in the in a 2019 paper which you can look up and 
the I'm not going to walk through the math now, but it, it turns out that if you look at the ratio of the volume of the white circles uh, divided by the ratio uh, divided by the volume of the of the gray circle, um, that ratio actually decreases extremely fast as you increase the dimensionality of the system. So as your as the length of that vector n gets larger and larger, the size of the gray circle grows much faster than the size of the white circles. And so when your dimensionality is sufficiently high, the chance of getting false positives is actually extremely low, but you still maintain that robustness uh, property. Okay, so here's a graph that uh, uh, shows this a little more quantitatively. On the x-axis, I'm showing the dimensionality of the vectors. And on the y-axis, I'm showing the frequency of uh, false matches. That is, if, if, you're, uh, if you have some pattern that's recognized uh, on a dendrite and you pick some other random pattern, what is the chance that it's going to match uh, this dendrite? And I've picked parameters here where, you, where the dendrite can tolerate about 50% noise. So 50% of those non-zero elements can actually be different and is still going to recognize the pattern. But as you can see, the chance of false positives or recognizing other patterns uh, decreases exponentially uh, with the dimensionality. Okay. Um, and so the, the graph on the left was with binary vectors. It, and with scalar vectors, you can get a very similar uh, property as long as the overall magnitudes of the components are, are bad. So what this shows is that these highly sparse representations are quite stable. You can recognize very distorted and noisy versions of the prototypical patterns without getting interference from other patterns. Okay, so how does this relate to plasticity and our and our and learning in neurons? So here's our uh, uh, pyramidal neuron again um, uh, with the dendritic segments. So we can actually model this as a simplified neuron as follows. So we can uh, split up these dendritic segments into independent vectors that are feeding into that unit. So here we've separ separated out uh, the green uh, part, which is these feed forward patterns. And then you have sparse local context and possibly top down context. So each of these horizontal lines are recognizing a single sparse pattern independent from the others. Um, and all of those are, are feeding into this uh, neuron. Okay. So um, we can use the exact same learning roles that I've uh, showed earlier. That is, if a cell ever becomes active, um, if the segment detected a pattern, then we want to reinforce that segment. If no segment detected a pattern, then we grow new connections on new dendritic segments. And if the cell did not become active at all, but one of these segments, uh, if the cell did not become active with these segments detected patterns, then we weaken that segment. And in here, um, learning uh, consists of growing and dropping connections. And the learning rules are continuous. So these neurons are learning continuously. But since we have the stability property of, of, uh, that I mentioned earlier, and, and that the learning itself is sparse, that is, they're uh, isolated to these little uh, artificial dendritic segments, new patterns that are learned are not going to interfere with the old ones. Uh, the chances of any sort of interference happening as you learn new things is extremely low, exponentially low. So this is a way you can have a single neuron uh, recognizing highly sparse patterns in a manner that is both stable, that is, it can recognize you know, perturbed versions of that pattern, and plastic, that it can quickly learn uh, new patterns very quickly. Okay, so this is, um, so to, uh, to summarize, I've sort of walked through the stability plasticity dilemma and how sparse representations can help ameliorate uh, catastrophic forgetting. So I've shown that sparse high dimensional representations are remarkably stable. Um, and I've shown how local plasticity rules can enable uh, the capability to learn new patterns uh, without interference. Okay, so that was all focused on a single neuron. Let's see how we can uh, put it together into a network model to get an unsupervised uh, uh, continuously learning system. So our, uh, the network model that we put together is uh, called HTM sequence memory. Uh, HTM stands for hierarchical temporal memory. And on the left, I'm showing you our model neuron, which uh, recognized lots of uh, independent sparse patterns on these little artificial dendritic segments. And what we've done is uh, we've created, on the right, we've shown a network of these neurons where each neuron is getting some feed forward 
uh, activity from below that's shown in green. And the neurons are also getting recurrent activity from the other neurons around it uh, shown in blue, and those will be uh, treated as local context. And everything is always sparse here. The network is, is uh, activity is constantly sparse. And the, I'm not gonna walk through the algorithm in detail here, but the way this network works is that every neuron is associating the past activity as context for the current activity. That is the activity of the network at time t minus one is treated as uh, context and biases the activity of uh, uh, and the response of the neuron to feed forward inputs at time t. Okay, so past context is treated as a modulatory input uh, and and uh, impacts the current uh, activity. Okay, so we think of this past context as forming predictions on the neuron. So each neuron is predicting based on what happened at time t minus one whether it's going to recognize its feed forward pattern or not. And if you look at the three learning rules that I presented earlier um, and, you, and deploy them here, um, what happens is that the, each neuron and the network as a whole is constantly learning from prediction errors. So if the neuron spikes, but there was uh, no past context detected, that's treated as an error, and it's gonna learn to recognize that past context. Conversely, if it recognized that past context and there was no uh, feed forward activity, that's also an error and it's gonna start forgetting that past context, okay? So in this manner, every neuron and the network as a whole learns continuously. And because everything is highly sparse here, uh, it can learn without forgetting uh, past patterns. And it turns out these networks can actually learn quite complex high Markov order sequences where you have to remember the context from several time steps into the past in order to make predictions about the, about the present. And this is all uh, detailed in our 2016 paper I noted there. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of examples. Here's an artificial example that shows how such a network can do continuous learning and uh, demonstrate fault tolerance. So the input here consists of a continuous stream of non-Markov sequences that's interspersed with random input. So I've shown some example sequences here where you have X, A, B, C, D, E, followed by some noise, followed by, let's say, Y, A, B, C, F, G, and so on. And the task is to constantly predict the next element in the sequence. Um, so for example, if you are, uh, if you see the letters X, A, B, C, and D, you would predict E. And if you had instead see the letters Y, A, B, C, and F, you would be predicting G. And notice that this requires, in order to do this correctly, you need to remember context from several time steps in the past. Okay. And the way this is set up, the maximum accuracy that you can get is uh, 50%. Okay, so here are two graphs that show the, how the system works. On the left, I'm showing um, the accuracy of the system that's shown in the red plot, red curve there. Um, and it's just fed these sequences with no prior training. So it, uh, in a few hundred uh, iterations, it, it learns to recognize and predict these sequences. And what we did is right in the middle here is we completely changed the, what the sequences were midstream. Okay, so all the predictions that were we're making were now incorrect. And as you can see, the network uh, will quickly uh, you know, recognize that it'll start making prediction errors. And because the learning is continuous, it'll quickly recover and go back up to that 50% uh, baseline. On the right graph, we're showing what happens when you have fault tolerance. So here, uh, you know, the first part of the curve is the same as before. Uh, it's learned these sequences, but um, as shown in the middle, we now randomly killed a fraction of the cells uh, yeah, in, in the system. Um, and as you can see, the, the system actually is remarkably resilient. Even up to 75%, um, you know, killing up to 75% of the cells, because the system is actually adding and dropping connections, it can recover and rewire itself and learn to now make predictions, uh, um, you know, shortly after that. So we've applied this to uh, real world streaming data as well. Uh, here's an example of a streaming data source uh, that comes from the New York City Metropolitan Authority. Uh, this data stream uh, shows taxi uh, demand over uh, several days. Um, in the actual data stream, it's actually over several months. And the basic idea is there's a canonical sort of up and down pattern and weekday and weekend patterns. And the task is at any point in time, predict the future demand so that the uh, taxi companies kind of, kind of, um, uh, you know, look at the demand and, and plan their capacity accordingly. 
So on the right, I'm showing the prediction error for different network models that we tried on it. Uh, and uh, the rightmost bar shows the, the performance, the error for our model. And as you can see, it's on par with the best uh, uh, deep learning systems that we had at the time, which were LSTM based. And the error of the HTM is roughly the same as the LSTM. What's really interesting is what happens now when the dynamics of the pattern actually change. So here I'm showing error over time. In green, I'm showing the error of the HTM. Uh, I'm sorry, in green is the error of the LSTM, and in red is the error of the HTM model. Um, and the vertical dotted line shows a point in time where the dynamics of the pattern were changed. So we artificially changed the, the you know, what, what uh, the, the demand at different uh, points in the day and different uh, you know, weekday versus weekend patterns. And what happens is that shortly after that, the error in for both the LSTM and the HTM spikes up. But the HTM, because it's continuously learning uh, and it's not a batch system, can actually recover and go back to a baseline system very quickly. On the, the LSTM, on the other hand, even though we're constantly retraining the system, it takes a long time before the new statistics are a significant percentage of the um, of the full data set, um, and it takes a long time for it to recover. Um, and very quickly, um, we've also tried this on anomaly detection. Uh, there's a benchmark that we've created for anomaly detection in streaming applications. Uh, it consists of uh, hundreds of thousands of real world uh, data points. Um, and we've created a scoring system that encourages the early detection uh, of anomalies in here. This is fully published and it's an open resource for the community. And this, these data streams actually have pretty uh, changing statistics, as you can see from this example I show at the bottom left here, um, with three anomalies uh, actually shown in the red circle. On the right, what I'm showing is the performance of a number of different common anomaly detection methods, as well as the HTM. And the HTM is able to respond and detect anomalies better than any of those uh, other systems, primarily because, again, it is continuously learning. It can uh, it, you know, it's detecting the previous patterns, and whenever there's an error in its prediction, that's treated as an anomaly. What happens is many of these streams is there's some change in the stream. Um, it'll detect us at, at that as an anomaly, but if it's a, a persistent change, it's going to treat that as the new normal and quickly adapt to it, and it's not going to keep giving false positives. Um, and that's one of the main reasons uh, why the score can be uh, so high. So in summary, um, I've covered three different things. I've tried given a quick review of sparsity in the neocortex. I've tried to show what we know about neural activations and neural connectivity and how they're highly sparse. Uh, I've shown that uh, neurons can actually detect dozens of independent sparse patterns. And the, the reality of how neurons compute based on input is very different from the point neuron patterns that we use in deep learning. Um, the learning itself is sparse and incredibly dynamic. In the second part of the talk, I talked about the representational uh, properties and how sparse representations can uh, help solve the stability plasticity dilemma and uh, get rid of uh, potentially help get rid of ca uh, catastrophic forgetting. And in the third part of the talk, I showed how we can take all of these, put it together into a network model, and create a biologically inspired, unsupervised, continuously learning system. And the uh, the properties of this system. Uh, it depends on the fact that these representations are extremely sparse and inherently stable. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, um, please uh, don't hesitate to send me an email and I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you.